If you recall from our first unit, we discussed Harold Laswell's definition of politics. His definition of politics includes the who, what, and how. Who gets, what do they get, and how people get what they want. This lecture will address the who, what, and how as it relates to interest groups. Part of this lecture will be on your own and part will be in class. Let's get started. Interest groups consist of people with shared policy goals who try to influence public policy. These groups work in many arenas. For example, they try to influence public policy by lobbying members of Congress to take a particular position on a law, or they try to influence policy in the judicial branch by bringing a lawsuit to court. Interest groups and political parties are not the same. Political parties fight election battles, and the central, and the central goal is to get their candidate elected to public office while interest groups don't fill candidates for office. In addition, political parties are policy generalists, while interest groups are policy specialists. They know a lot about one topic, for example, gun control or education. Now that you know what an interest group is, think about why they exist. The first re reason are cleavages. Due to the diversity of the, in the, of the United States, there are a variety of different opinions, beliefs, and interests. Each of these differences needs a group to represent them. The second reason is the Constitution. There are numerous access points to the government created by the Constitution. The Constitution creates three branches of government, which allows groups to influence them all. Lastly, political parties are growing weaker. Many interest groups will bypass political parties and seek to influence the government directly. If you recall from Unit 1, we discussed the different theories that explain how groups influence public policy. Let's review the concept quickly. The pluralist theory describes a situation in which groups compete. All people are represented and groups compete and counterbalance each other. The elite theory argues that few groups that are most wealthy control most of the power. Lastly, the hyperpluralist theory emphasizes the idea that groups are so strong that the government is weakened. The next three slides will examine in detail the theories of interest group politics. The central idea of pluralism in group theory is that some groups win and some lose, but no group wins or loses all the time. According to this theory, no one group will become dominant. If one group does become too dominant, then a competing group will be intensified and restore the balance. Even as groups intensify, the groups still play by the rules of the game. No lying, cheating, stealing, or violence. Ultimately, all legitimate groups are able to affect public policy. Depending on the group, the resources that are intensified vary. For example, big business uses money, and labor unions use the size of the membership as a resource. Supporters of the pluralist theory acknowledge that some groups will be stronger than others, and they don't always get an equal hearing. However, lobbying is open to all, and therefore unequal access is not a problem. The elitist theory rests on the belief that a few big interests run the government and receive benefits for themselves only. Many of the largest corporations hold the most power, and often that power is interlocking and concentrated. What does that mean? 
Well, a person who might serve on the board of one large corporation might also serve on another board. About one third of top institutional positions are occupied by people who hold more than one such position. Yes, there are many groups, but unlike the groups in the pluralist theory, these groups are extremely unequal in power. The elites, such as multinational corporations, will receive benefits while consumers' interests are ignored. In other words, elitist lobby groups, excuse me, elitist lobbying benefits a few people at the expense of many. The increasing number of interest groups has led to what Theodore Lowy calls interest group liberalism. According to this theory, the government gives too much deference to groups. Interest group liberalism supports the belief that the demand of all groups are legitimate and it is the job of government to advance them all. To please every interest, government agencies try to address the demands of all groups. In an effort to please all groups, more agencies are created. These agencies will often create conflicting res regulations and duplicate services. Above all, hyperpluralism results in increasing government spending. This slide lists the different types of interest groups. Take time to review each type of interest group as explained in Chapter 11. Some facts to know include information about membership rates. Americans join some groups more frequently than people in other nations. Social, business, professional, veterans, and charitable rate of membership is the same in most places. People are less likely to join labor unions and more likely to join religious, political, and civic groups. Also, the greater sense of political efficacy and civic duty explain the tendency to join civic groups. How do interest groups achieve their goal of influencing public policy? This slide lists many techniques interest groups employ, but not all interest groups use the same tactics. One of the single most important tactics interest groups use is supplying credible information. Interest groups provide current information. This information is often technical. Remember, elected officials are not policy experts like interest groups are. Interest groups often hire lobbyists who make face-to-face -face contact with a member of Congress or a staffer. Lobbyists focus on the undecided legislator or bureaucrat. Interest groups can garner mass appeals and mobilize the grassroots where they get, where they get people without obvious political power to come together and influence policy makers. Like the previous slide, there are ideas listed that you can learn about in Chapter 11. Interest groups also create PACs which donate money to politicians. There are some who believe money is the least effective way to influence po politicians. Some of the arguments that support such a statement include money is available to everyone. Most interest groups give to both sides. Next, although members of Congress take money, they still make decisions contrary to the interest group. And finally, almost any organization can create a PAC. They are created by corporations, unions, ideological groups, and a variety of other entities, not just interest groups. Do you agree with this statement? Please prepare please be prepared to explain and defend your answer. Again, the statement is interest groups, excuse me, um, money is the least effective way to influence politicians.
Thanks for your time. See you soon.